Okay, so we've gone live. So um, I'm just going to do a quick introduction. We are hosted today by um, SSN. And what I will do is I will um, ask um, Dr. Surya to maybe introduce the institution and herself and today's webinar. I will go on to mute and then we will start from there. So uh, can I just ask Norway to mute itself? So Dr. Sriha, uh, let me just, uh, sorry, I've got, I've, I've got a bit of feedback, but I'll stop that. All right, great. So um, Dr. Sriha, if you would like to introduce yourself to the institution, and then we will go forward with the webinar. Thank you very much. Dr. Sriya, at the moment, I think you're actually on um, mute, or maybe your microphone hasn't been picked up. Um, there's a little settings panel, which you might have to look at. And whilst Dr. Sriha does that, I will just quickly introduce myself. Um, you're good? Whilst Dr. Saria sorts out her microphone, I would just quickly introduce that um, my name is Martin Peacock, and I will be one of your hosts um, today. Um, we are, um, I'm, I am web, um, I'm sharing my screen at the moment, so hopefully you can see um, the ZP and um, SSN um, symbol. So you understand that this is a webinar that's hosted um, by us both. Um, we're the guests of SSN. I'm just let's see if Dr. Saria's microphone is working. If not, I will. Um, I'm happy to carry on. Um, so what I will do is, whilst we're whilst we're waiting for Dr. Saria's microphone to um, let's say work, what I will do is. Um, I will say well, welcome um, to this live streaming webinar. It's always good, obviously good fun to be live streaming. Um, so we're live streaming from um, three venues today. Um, we're live streaming from, personally, I'm often based in the UK, but I'm actually in um, Barcelona in Spain. Um, we, um, we have um, SSN, which is um, in India. So we're also live streaming from India. And we're also um, live streaming from my colleagues in Norway. So I'll just do another um, sound check with um, Dr. Saria. Dr. Saria, can you hear us? You can hear us, but it's the microphone. OK. Right. All right. So um, what I will do then is um, um, so we are sponsored today by um, SRI, um, Nadir College of Engineering. Um, we've been in communication for a short while, and um, the um, college asked us to maybe host a webinar with them. And um, the original intent of that um, webinar was to um, provide educational material, let's say, to the students, but we've also expanded the brief and um, the brief um, a little bit today as well. And we will also be um, covering um, some live demonstrations. So we'll be doing um, things like a demonstration of measuring chili. We'll be doing a live demonstration on measuring nitrate. Um, we'll also be doing a live demonstration of glucose sensing. And um, I'll also be talking about um, electrochemical and penis spectroscopy. What I will say is I will go forward with the webinar and then when if Dr. Sri here is able to get her microphone, then we will do a cutaway for me for a bit and Dr. Surya will introduce the um, institution. So um, having said that, uh, I'll transition to the um, next slide. I just want to thank our sponsors, Technando. So um, Zimmer and Peacock, we have um, a very good um, sister company in um, India called Technando, and they are the guys who have helped organize today's webinar. Um, so if you see the registration page, uh, et cetera, then it's those guys who put it together. They've also put all the speaking together. You'll hear me just interrupt myself on occasion and ask Dr. Sriya if, um, if the microphone is working. Um, 
If not, I will carry on. So um, today's content is meant to be um, educational um, and application focused. Um, so what I mean by that is um, we will, um, we've got, I'll do a quick introduction to Zimmer Peacock, but I'll try and be fast on that because I want to be very um, cautious of people's time. We are going to do an introduction to electrochemical techniques, and we're going to cover cyclovoltammetry. So when we talk about cyclovoltammetry, we'll actually use the example of um, capsaicin, which is the molecule in chilies, um, which is um, essentially the guy that gives you um, the sensation of hotness. So we will do um, a demonstration on chilies using cyclovoltammetry. We'll do a demonstration on potentiometry using nitrate. So nitrate's become very um, critical these days because it's become it's used obviously a lot in agriculture. It's becoming very expensive. It's also a source of pollution. We'll also then talk about amperometry, um, in particular glucose sensing, because you know um, electrochemistry and electrochemical biosensors. The biggest um, let's say application is still glucose. Sensing, and then we will talk about impedance spectroscopy. And then because the one of the um, pillars of this today's talk is we also want to talk about you know practical ways of doing these kind of experiments, we'll do about um, practical troubleshooting and then um, question and answers. So um, first of all, I do want to say thank you very much to our, um, our host university and Technando, and I will sort of go forward. And if anyone wants to, so I, if you have any questions, um, Put them in the chat. I can see that uh, many of you are saying hello. So we have somebody trying to watch the chat in real time. And um, um, put any questions there, and we'll try and spot them um, doing that. So um, my name is Martin. As I said, I've introduced myself quickly. Um, I'm both a, um, a lecturer at a university, um, but I'm also um, a co-founder at Zimmer and Peacock. If you're interested in communicating with us, um, just find us on LinkedIn. Uh, looking at the time, we're actually 13 minutes into this approximately, so I'll have to go a little bit faster. Um, we're a fairly large company. We have um, really state-of-the-art facilities in um, Norway, and we have um, a very large facility in Norway where we do our manufacturing, and we have a large building where we do our R&D. Uh, we also have... Um, facilities in the United Kingdom, two places, one in a place called Coventry and another place in Swansea. Um, our culture is very unique. That It's a very, it's a fairly young in terms of um, the ages of the people in the business. Um, and we do have a very sort of friendly um, atmosphere. We are corporate, but we don't run as sort of in a very, you know, the work is very professional and we're very organized, but we make sure that the place is friendly and people are, are able to enjoy themselves as well. If some of what I say today is um, is a little confusing, or not confusing, but there's a lot of information, we do have something called the ZP Academy. It's free. Um, and there you can find free modules, introduction to biosensors, and free uh, electrochemical techniques for biosensor developers. And we also have something called the uh, um, knowledge base. And under there, we have educational videos. So we do have um, let's say, webinars um, on things like impedance spectroscopy, 50-minute webinars on impedance spectroscopy, for example, as well. So um, also, I do try to encourage, now, we do like to do these webinars with universities because we want to encourage both the professors and the students to realize that they can actually, even though we might be remote, you know, um, you can still do master's projects with us, and we'll be happy then to sort of, you know, sponsor the materials and provide um, support. So these are some of the master's projects we had. We had one guy working on um, app development for biosensing. We had another person working on um, electronics for implantable sensors into fish. Another person developing what's called an immunoassay um, for um, doing biosensing and another one doing a sort of bacteria immunosensor. So we do do projects with people off the master's projects. And even if you're remote, we can still work with you. We do have something called the ZP Developer Zone. Every Thursday at 8 a.m. London time, we answer questions. 
I get lots of questions in, and then we put them into a webinar every week, and we answer them there. Um, now, as I say, this is the, the, this talk today is going to be educational components, applications, and demos. So, first of all, you know, this talk today is about um, electrochemistry essentially. So, we won't be talking about the study of corrosion, though that is very important to electrochemists. We won't be doing um, batteries and capacitors, though that is a very important aspect, you know, that electrochemistry can address. Um, we won't be doing um, electrosynthesis or electro um, electrolysis, though these are important industrial applications. What we're really talking about to do today is really electroanalysis, um, and then specifically underneath that, sensors and biosensors. I think if you were looking for a hierarchy of subjects, it's kind of chemistry. Um, analytical chemistry, and then we come under that as electroanalysis, and then under that you have sensors and biosensors. So the electroanalytical techniques that we'll be covering today is a technique called voltammetry. Voltammetry used to be done a lot in the laboratory, but not so much in actual industrial applications, but that really has changed. Um, so um, today we will be um, showing you a voltam, you know, doing a, well, we'll talk about voltammetry. We'll also be talking about amperometry. Amperometry is still the technique most commonly used, for example, in glucose sensing. And um, we will also be doing um, potentiometry. So we'll be doing a nitrate demonstration there. And then I will be talking about impedance spectroscopy um, as well. Now, um, what I will also be doing is, um, talking about, um, well, traditionally, electrochemistry was quite, I think, was was fairly off-putting for people because um, the hardware was, you know, quite big and, let's say, bulky. Um, but these days, um, the hardware has actually shrunk down um, quite considerably. So we don't need these kind of large um, potential stats. This is a CH instrument. We do actually own some of these. Something that used to put people off from electrochemistry was also the kind of these glass vessels, all these electrodes and wires sticking in it. And um, these days, you know, and, and, the, and even laptops actually, it just makes me think as well that we can actually reduce all this down to something that's quite small. So I know my screen will be quite small, um, but this is um, a modern potential stat, you know, and they're actually, they can actually be really small and, you know, just driven off, off the phone. And I think that's really one of the powers of electrochemistry as an electroanalytical technique that, um, you know, it's probably got some of the smallest instruments in, let's say, in the world. Um, and it's very, once you get down to something that's that small, then you have a very sort of scalable technology. You, um, um, sorry about the, the, the noise. I'm just going to get one of these sensors out. But the reason I was doing that was I was just sort of, you can get these sensors and they actually let you then just plug into, um, into the device itself. So now you have a, you know, something that looks very mobile, and that's the power of electrochemistry. That once upon a time it would be um, quite large instruments, laptops, trailing cables, and now we can actually reduce it down to something that's quite small um, and very, let's say, modern, and something that can actually be thought of as, you know, or converted into a product um, much more um, readily. So what I will do now is. So getting started, if you want to get started in biosensing and electrochemical chemistry, you probably need, um, we call them screen printed electrodes. I'm not going to over discuss that today, but these are electrodes that we essentially print. And um, they can also be used in educational, um, for educational training. I'll talk about that. We also have the connectors. Um, I did get a question this morning about connectors. So it's really important to have good connectors in this, in this world. Um, we also need a potential stat. Um, this is Diana Potts. And you also need a place to store and analyze and share your data. And we call that Julie. So I'll talk a bit quicker because I'm conscious of the time. So first of all, I'm going to dive into a technique called um, voltammetry. And so in voltammetry, um, if a solution um, contains an electrochemically active molecule, and in this case, um, I'm talking about ferricyanide and ferrocyanide, um, if you have a solution that contains, for example, um, ferrocyanide, and we apply what we call a voltage to it, we change that voltage, then we get a voltammogram. 
Now, the animation I'm showing here is cyclic voltammetry. So we're sweeping the voltage up and we're cycling it back again. So that's the cyclic and cyclic voltammetry. Now, what's actually happening here is we're looking at current versus voltage. And what we're doing is behind that, there's a waveform and it's called a triangular waveform. So we have voltage and what we're doing is we're changing the voltage, we're increasing it as a function of time. And then we're bringing the voltage back to the original, um, let's say, starting point. So that's a triangular waveform. And we get, a therefore, a corresponding um, um, voltammogram due to that. And so we have a start point or start voltage. We go to a second voltage, and then we cycle back to the, um, let's say, original voltage. And we do this kind of work on um, screen printed electrodes. These are very small um, pieces. And these experiments are actually really quite easy to do. You know, we literally here have a potential stat, and I have we have videos online of doing this, and we take the solution and we add it um, onto the tip of the sensor. And as I say, that is um, the technique itself is um, cyclovoltammetry. These experiments, you could do them in a few, let's say, minutes. And what's nice about this kind of setup is I previously showed a setup where there was a laptop. Um, Hello, Professor. Can you hear us OK? I'm just checking. Um, so what happens is you put a drop of solution um, onto that. You apply the voltage, and you get the corresponding um, voltammogram. So um, we, do, of course, today we are hosted um, by our colleagues in India. And if, once, if they want to introduce themselves, I'd be happy for them to do that at any time. Um, now, what's happening here is um, we call the mechanism an E mechanism. It's just simple. It's just electrochemistry. Um, um, I've just got a bit of feedback that apparently the details are, yeah. OK. So um, what I will do now is uh, just transition slightly. So what we're doing is we're um, sweeping voltage and um, measuring, let's say, current um, at the same time. And um, so we do that. We get the response in current. Now, what happens is the peak height that um, we're getting is, and I might actually stop sharing my screen for, uh, stop sharing my camera for a second, because um, I think, um, um, I think it. I think it slightly obscures um, some of the things um, that I'm um, showing. Um, sorry, I just need to do this for a second. Right. So um, with voltammetry, we change the voltage, we measure the current, and we call that. Um, linear sweep voltammetry or cyclic voltammetry if we return it. And I was saying that the um, the current that we get, the peak current, is actually proportional to the scan rate. So what's so the faster we scan, the higher the current. So here I would say that you know as we um, change the voltage, the current is actually um, not changing the voltage. As we change the scan rate, the um, current is going up. Now this is um, it can be characterized by an equation called the Randall-Sevick um, um, equation, which says that the peak of my voltammogram is proportional to the square root of my scan rate. Now, the reason this is happening is when you're applying too low a voltage, the, um, um, the, when you're applying too low a voltage, there's not enough energy to actually move the electrons from the molecule to the electrode. And so you keep on increasing the voltage until there's enough um, energy or otherwise potential in the units of voltage to move the electrons from the molecule um, onto the electrode. And then we get the flow of current. But um, the current keeps on increasing as long as the voltage is, um, let's say, increasing. But there's a point at which you can't apply any more voltage and get any more current, because actually the molecule can't diffuse fast enough. And you get a peak 
because you're applying so much potential and so many and so many molecules are being oxidized that the diffusion of the molecules to the surface um, are um, they can't keep up with it. They can't keep up with the um, with the electron transfer at the electrode, and therefore um, you hit what's called diffusion limitation, and um, Maybe it's got a square root. It's got a square root arrangement with the. Um, Hello, if you want to speak, hello. Um, so um, what we do is we say that the um, peak current is therefore proportional to the um, square root of the scan rate, and it's the randall Slavic equation. Now I'm going to jump into something that um, I, w I don't want to say it's complicated, um, but what we've just described is the voltammogram of fairy and for ferrocyanide, and that is actually quite, I would not say simple, but it is relatively, because what we're now going to dive into is something called capsaicin. Um, now, capsaicin is the molecule that is in chilies. So I said today, I didn't say it too well, but we're actually talking today about food and um, uh, agricultural applications of electrochemistry, and so we're starting to move now from electrochemistry in the lab towards electrochemistry in the food um, application. So what I'm going to do now is say, look, there's a molecule called capsaicin. Um, this is the animation of the voltammogram of... Uh, sorry to interrupt, uh, uh, Dr. Martin. I have fixed my uh, mic now. Is it fine? That, uh, lovely, to, uh, lovely to hear from you. So um, I will stop... Um, I will stop sharing for a second and ask you to please yes. yeah, go ahead. Thank you. Sure. Thank you for uh, your time, Dr. Martin, and uh, it's very nice of you. And uh, uh, I take privilege uh, to introduce uh, Dr. Martin here. And. Dr. Martin Peacock is currently Honorary Senior Lecturer at Swansea University, Wales, UK, and he is the Director of uh, Zimmer and Peacock, a biosensor manufacturing company based in UK and Norway. And uh, Dr. Martin Peacock is an industrial biochemist with over 20 years of biosensor experience, having had industrial roles from about diabetes to GSK and solving technical challenges from continuous glucose monitoring to RNA analysis. Uh, in recent years, he has set up biosensor-focused companies across the globe from Silicon Valley, California to Oslo, Norway. And uh, at Zimmer and Peacock, uh, uh, they are uh, distilling uh, their experience into providing a turnkey solution to accelerate the collaborators from various uh, parts of the country uh, uh, to realize their research uh, outcomes into products. And uh, Zimmer and Peacock achieves this acceleration by providing a range of products and servicing, including sensors, electronics, apps, laboratory testing, cloud database, IP generation, and turnkey manufacturing. So uh, uh, adding to that, uh, uh, it is really nice to uh, see a company working with academia and uh, taking the dreams of academic people into uh, realistic uh, products. So when, I, when we approached uh, Dr. Martin for this, uh, uh, we have used some of the uh, Zimmeran product, uh, uh, Zimmeran uh, Peacock products. And when we approached Dr. Martin for a lecture, so he was like very uh, um, simple and yes, I can. So that was the first response I got. And we were very happy to have uh, Dr. Martin here. And uh, uh, it's my honor to introduce SSN also. So SSN is uh, founded by Dr. Shiv Nadar in the year 1998 and uh, assist a concern of HCL Enterprise. And uh, 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 without much introduction about SSN, and uh, I would uh, say that uh, we would we love working at SSN and uh, it is a, a complete research-oriented academia university. So uh, uh, now, uh, Dr. Martin, uh, that's all about from my side. Thank you very much. And can, could you please continue the lecture? I'm uh, participants and uh, Dr. Martin, I'm sorry for the uh, technical uh, difficulties we had. Well, first of all, thank you very much for having us. And yeah. um, th thank you very much for um, organizing this. We do appreciate it. And 
I think, as you say, you know, when you ask us to do these things, you know, we want, you know, we, we, we come at it with the mindset that we want to, you know, help the students, you know, and, 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 to, um, and it's in our nature to collaborate. So we do appreciate the kind invite. We're always happy to accept these. And yeah, I will continue, but thank you very much. And well done for fixing the microphone. Good, to, thank you. So what I will do then is I will um, share my screen a little bit and say, I'll just do a quick recap then. So, um, and the recap is this. So far we've, um, you know, we've said that we're gonna do three demonstrations today. And we're gonna first of all talk about voltammetry and then we're gonna do a demonstration on measuring chili. So, so far on voltammetry, I've kind of said, you know, you sweep the voltage, you get a current response. The peak height of that voltammogram is actually proportional to the square root of um, the scan rate for simple systems. And now we're actually going to describe a more, let's say, complicated um, system, which I am now describing. Um, what we're looking at here is the voltammogram of um, capsaicin. Capsaicin is the molecule in um, chilies and... Uh, it's the reason that you kind of get that sensation of hotness. Now, when you look at um, this voltammogram, when we first do the voltammogram, and it will be happening now, you're going to notice that there's a what we call an oxidation peak. This is the this is the oxidation of capsaicin into what I would call a cation radical. Um, and now, what happens is a little bit more complicated than that because. The cation radical itself is actually quite reactive, and it reacts with water, and it essentially hydrolyzes. So we're in the first oxidation wave, which I'm kind of hovering my mouth, mouth around here, oxidation wave one, we oxidize the molecule to a cation radical. It reacts with the water, and actually we form a new species. Now what happens is we then reduce this on the backwards scan, we reduce um, the new species, um, which was a quinone into a quinol. And um, what's happening there is um, we, um, we, we are reducing it and we get, we get what's called a um, reduction wave. So there, so there goes the reduction wave. Now what's happening is that molecule is now a new molecule. So when we do the second scan, lo and behold, a new um, peak appears. And that's because we actually formed a new molecule. So I'll just recap this slightly. The voltammogram of ferricyanide was um, quite simple. We were just oxidizing and reducing. I just said that's an E mechanism. Here I'm saying now we're getting into the real world and actually the voltammograms are not so simple anymore. This is the voltammogram of capsaicin. Capsaicin is the molecule that gives you the hotness in chilies. And what's happening is we're getting what's called, a, first of all, an E mechanism. We get the electrochemical oxidation of the capsaicin. Then we get C, which is a chemical reaction. We form a new product, and we get a, a new oxidation for that new product. And so we turn that E, C, um, E mechanism. I must just give my colleagues in Norway a little heads up that in a minute, what we're going to do is start transitioning towards them, and they'll do a... Um, demonstration for us. But um, I'm going to sort of slightly say that at Zimmer and Peacock, we do have a, for example, a chili sensor. And the reason that we have a chili sensor is it's a nice application because, you know, there's in food industry, there's food quality and food safety. So the chili sensor is a good way of doing food quality. The problem is, see, with chilies that there's a subjective experience. People put chilies in their mouth and depending on, on their culture, you know, they either conceive it as, perceive it as um, um, hot, medium, or mild, for example. But that's not an objective experience. And so, you know, consumers these days, you know, and even as scientists, we have to think about the consumers. You know, they want, they often want a, um, a consistent experience. And so, um, what we're doing um, here is, we're saying, okay. To have quality control in the chili industry, we need an objective measurement. And at the moment, to get an objective measurement in the chili industry, there's um, um, there's sort of four ways of doing it. There's analytical testing using something like an HPLC, a high pressure liquid chromatography. I'm sure some of the chemists um, today will be familiar with HPLC. Um, 
it's very expensive. It's very hard to run these machines. Um, there's no way you can do it on a factory floor. So it's not really that practical for actually food production. Um, you can have what's called panel testing, um, where a number of people all test and taste the products and then they fill in a form and you, you make a sort of statistic and analysis on it. Um, you can have really, I think a lot of what happens is in the sort of chili production facility, the head of quality tests it himself or themselves or herself, and they perceive whether the product's in specification or not. And then we have the chili um, sensor itself. And so the chili sensor is actually based on a um, the idea of a glucose sensor where you just will bring the sample to the sensor and you get an immediate result. And we've reduced that down to something called the food sense. When you look at the food sense, I talked today about the nice thing about electrochemistry is that the potential stats can be very, let's say, shrunk down. Um, and um, we, um, we've done that. So there's a very small, and there's an electrode, and then there's um, an app that runs it. So what I will now do is I will um, transition to my friends in Norway. So what I will do is um, ask Norway to come online, and I will um, stop sharing. Hey, hey, can you guys hear us? Um, um, I will stop sharing. Yeah, go ahead, Solren. Hey, uh, so uh, my name is Solren, and I'm a scientist here at Serum Peacock. And uh, today with me here is my colleague. Hello. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, uh, he is Andre Fernandez. Um, and uh, so we will start off uh, showing the uh, cyclical tomatry experiments uh, with uh, Chile. So uh, for this, we have um, a, a food sense box, which is a small potential stats that will run through the cyclic voltometry. And then we have an app um, on our iPhone. Uh, so we would uh, um, access the food sense app like this, and we can choose uh, different analytes to look at. And today we will um, obviously look at chili. So we'll uh, pick chili and then um, we'll make sure that the hardware is connected. I've already gone through this, uh, but here the um, food sense box is connected. And what we will do is that we'll insert uh, one of our hyper value sensors and uh, that I'm showing you now. Um, and um, yeah, so it has uh, three electrodes and we will insert it into uh, the food sense box. So we'll insert it like this. And now we will pipette a mixture of uh, Tabasco and chili pop buffer. So we have a uh, chili pop buffer, um, which we will mix with either uh, Tabasco, like chili sauces. But what we can also do is that we can um, have a uh, fresh chili and uh, grind it up for, uh, for example, using a food processor and, and uh, weigh it out on the balance and then add it to that buffer that I showed you. And then um, we will add it onto the electrodes. So the buffer is just for us to um, sort of like yeah, calibrate the system and make sure that we have like an electrolyte. Um, so what we will do is that we'll um, adds approximately 50 microliters. Uh, that's sufficient for uh, for covering the electrodes. Um, and what we need to do is we need to cut the uh, pipette tip slightly, uh, just because the um, as we all know, like the chili uh, and the chili sauces might be a bit chunky and um, have some lumps in it. So just for us to be able to actually uh, get all of the solution into the pipette, we'll just cut the tip. So um i'm now pipetting 50 microliters um and i'm making sure that all the electrodes uh, of the sensor is covered and now i will hit measure on the on the iphone in the app so like this and now it'll start running and what it's doing now is what martin showed you um, where it's running through that cyclic voltometry where you get like an oxidation peak and then a reduction peak and an oxy uh, oxygen peak again. And um, the peak heights are 
um, proportional to the um, amount of capsaicin in this solution. So it's um, basically like um, um, measuring um, the units, the heat units, the scoville heat units of the uh, of the solution. Uh, so now it's soon done. Um, and now we got a got a number for the scoville heat units, which again is proportional to the um, to the spiciness or the capsaicin of the chili sauce. So perfect. that's how easy it is. Yeah, that's perfect. Well done. Okay. Well, so um, so I appreciate that. And what I'll do is, if you stop sharing your screen, guys, I will uh, start sharing my screen. Um, so if to recap on the demo. Um, you know, we use the demo to sort of indicate, um, to talk about um, psychovoltametry. So, um, <clears throat> if the guy stop that, if the guy stop sharing that screen in Norway, it's great. So we literally have, you know, obviously turning a um, a lab experiment into a product is quite a process. Um, and you saw really with that, you know, how in fact you get a very nice user experience, despite there actually being some quite complicated or complex science going on in that instrument you know and what you saw that was very important was it didn't give um you know microamps which means nothing to you know it actually gave out the scoville heat unit which is the sort of industry recognized unit and these chili sources uh, at least in europe are often about 5000 scoville heat units one of the top top selling chili sources um in Europe and the US is called Tabasco source, and they're often two and a half to 5,000 Scoville heat units, which sounds quite variable, but it's it's logarithmic, so it's actually not so, well, actually that, that makes it sound even worse. But they are quite variable. I don't think the tongue perceives the tastes, um, the, the hotness so well. So what I'm gonna do now is, um, I'm gonna stop sharing my video, but I'll carry on sharing the screen, and say that we're gonna transition now into iron selective electrodes. So we're going to go back to Norway in a bit. But first of all, we've discussed voltammetry. Um, now we're going to discuss potentiometry. And in a potentiometric sensor, everyone is familiar with potentiometric sensors. Um, the potentiometric sensor um, is the, the most classic one would be, for example, the pH sensor that's used um, in the lab. So people are really familiar with, it, with these kind of sensors. Um, and even these days now, you don't, if you want to measure pH, the pH sensors of the future will not be the, the pH meters that you're, you're sort of using today. They will definitely be shrinking down in size, um, and you'll be able to use them off your phone as well. I mean, it's, ZP could, could essentially do this today. It's just whether the market is there for it, um, if we do it today. But yeah, modern technologies mean that, you know, even the pH meter that you're quite familiar with in chemistry laboratories um, can undergo a revolution um, as well. Now, these um, potentiometric measurements, well, they're often governed um, by an equation called the um, Nernst equation. I, um, I think our host today could derive this equation for you. I'm not going to derive it for you. But what's important to me um, in this equation is that um, the voltage is proportional to the log of the concentration. So the voltage on a pH meter is proportional to pH. You know, the P and pH stands for minus log to the base 10. So it says that the signal is proportional to the log of the analyte of interest. And so a pH sensor is actually a form of ion selective electrode. Ion selective electrodes, um, they often have a reference electrode in them. In the, in the past, they might have even had what was called a calomel electrode in them. That was mercury-based. That's very unlikely nowadays and probably almost illegal. Um, these days, people often use silver, silver chloride. And then they'll have a, um, a working electrode that is specific to the analyte of interest. And we call that, for example, a um, the, the molecules that we're trying to detect with are often called um, ionophores. Um, so we have reference electrodes and we have um, an ionophore based electrode. And what we're doing is we're measuring the voltage between these um, two electrodes. And so rather than doing it on that sort of large glass 
pH electrode. We like to do it on these small screen printed electrodes. Um, and so what we can do is we have a working electrode that we've functionalized to be specific to the analyte of interest. So in a bit, the guys in Norway will show you a nitrate sensor. And, and so we have a working electrode that's specific, for example, in our case, for example, nitrate. And we also have a reference electrode so we can measure the voltage at our working electrode versus the um, reference electrode. Um, so a potentiometric sensing system actually is quite simple. You know, there are lots of engineers out there who can design you a, um, a high impedance potentiometric circuit. Um, and, you know, you just measure voltage. And as long as the surface that you, you're using to sense is, is sensitive to the analyte, then you could have a voltage versus um, analyte concentration um, signal. Now that's interesting, but what we're doing at Zimmer and Peacock then is taking this principle and applying it to you know practical products. So you know, I was very, I was very, um, you know, when we were introduced, we said that you know what makes Zimmer and Peacock different is that we like to apply the science into actual real, real world applications. And so here, you can see that we actually have a little screen printed electrode, um, and what we're doing is we're actually putting these screen printed electrodes into these kind of rods you know so you have a human arm in there so you get a sense of the scale of this and we actually bury that into the soil so that we can measure um the nitrate at depths of 30 centimeters and 60 centimeters the reason this is important is i know that one of the biggest um one of the biggest um industries in india as an example is actually agriculture um but also you have, you know, like as in Europe and in the US, you know, farmers are putting on fertilizers onto the fields and they've no way of knowing really how much fertilizer is on the field. And the fertilizers are actually running off the field um, and causing a problem called eutrophication where it gets into the water course and um, actually lots of algae are growing, the oxygen drops and the fish die. So you do have a local pollution issue. You also have another issue that 1.2% of all global carbon dioxide production goes into nitrate production. So it is important to reduce the um, nitrates. So at Zimmer Peacock, we've actually created a system of nitrate sensors that can actually communicate with a base station and send the data to the cloud where we can actually display it on an apps. And we can have several of these sensors in a field all communicating and all sending the data either to our app or to third-party dashboards. So that's the conversion of taking a lab, a, a lab sensor, making it robust, putting it in the soil, measuring the nitrate in the soil, and then you're able to give farmers real-time feedback on how much um, nitrate is actually in um, their field. Now, we've also taken this technology and obviously put it into the real world. So this is um, some nitrate sensors going into a um, field there's a so that there's in this case they have to be solar powered because obviously you have to think about the power um we put a whole series of them in, in the ground um and this is the data that's come from them so there's a suspicion that two-thirds of all fertilizers added to the fields are actually wasted i think that's really is true so here what we're showing is we go to a, a farmer's field we put in five nitrate sensors, and now I'll explain the data to you. I will speak quite quickly because I realize you know it's 10 to the hour and we need to crack on, let's say. So what's happening here is this. Um, approximately on the 30th of March, the farmer adds some fertilizer to the field. So this is the green arrow here. Now the nitrate is actually going along quite steady at about 20 ppm. And you'll notice that in fact the nitrate decreases so even though he's added nitrate the nitrate decreases and the reason it decreases is because i suppose when you're making a sensor system you have to think of lots of parameters and luckily or by design we actually had a humidity sensor a soil humidity sensor in there as well so what's actually happening is the nitrate was stable but in fact the ground started drying out just about the same time as the farmer had added the fertilizer. So in fact, he wasn't getting the benefit of it and the nitrate was not available because it was not solubilized. So in fact, nothing happened up until about the 2nd of May 
when it rained, at which point the nitrate levels shot up because it became, it was an inorganic material that became solubilized and actually got into the soil. But what would happen was the farmer added more nitrate, but in fact, the, you know, the nitrate was at a level of about 40 ppm. So it already doubled because of the previous nitrate addition. The farmer didn't know and he added more nitrate. And in fact, he added more nitrate on top of nitrate. And what happened was they got, you know, I'd almost say an excess of nitrate. All this time it's raining. And then to compound the problem, they added more nitrate, and then they hit a dry patch, and the soil dried out really quite quickly, and they didn't get the benefit until the rain came back. So this shows you that the farmer could have had a more of adaptive, um, uh, if he'd known about the nitrate, he would have actually only added one of these doses and not the other two. And so that I, I made a little statement. I said that a lot of people think that two thirds of the nitrate fertilizers added to the soil are wasted. And the answer is they're correct. And the reason that they they can't do smart addition of nitrates because they don't have any sensors in the ground. And that's what we are hoping to solve. You're not hoping this is what we have solved, let's say, um, here. So if I recap, you are familiar with um, potentiometric measurements. Any of you in the lab are doing pH measurements a lot. Um, and um, these um, pH um, measurements are done with a potentiometric sensor. We are not doing pH, we're doing actually nitrate, but we means we just change what's called the ionophore. You can also do potassium, calcium, sodium, um, ammonium. You know, they all have a, like an ionophore. Um, so we've made a nitrate one. And then more importantly, you have to get these sensors out of the lab and into the real world um, and try and productize this kind of stuff. And that's what we've um, discussed here. So what we're going to now do is I'm going to um, stop sharing. I'm going to turn my camera off. It's going to go to my colleagues in Norway, and they're going to do a quick demonstration of this technology. So Norway, are you there? Hello again. So we are back. Uh, welcome to our uh, nitrate demo. So in this instance, we are going to use uh, a nitrate sensor. In this case, is one of uh, the ceramic uh, sensors from uh, Zimmer and Peacock. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to use this Anapot, and which, which is a, one of the ZP's potential stats. And I'm going to insert the sensor onto this slot, like my colleague Soren did on the food sensor earlier. And uh, what we are going to do is now I have two uh, nitrate solutions that I'll pipette onto the sensor. The important thing is to cover the electrodes. So I'll start with a low concentration nitrate solution and I'll pipette five, uh, 50 um, uh, microliters, covering all those electrodes, working counter and reference on, on the ceramic. And we the, the anapod, so the potential stat is connected to our software, which is a PS Trace software that we use, a scientific software. And uh, as you can see on this screen, and we are connected uh, so to the board that is inside the anapod. We are going to run here. Uh, we are just all measuring the open circuit potential. We have all the current range selected. This is just the interval. It's just your sampling rate, basically. And we're just running it. We don't need such a long demo, I believe. So for 500 seconds. So when I press play here, we start measuring the potential uh, of this uh, low concentrated nitrate solution. We just uh, let it uh, basically uh, run for a bit, stabilize for a bit. And afterwards, uh, what I will do uh, with the help of my colleague again, Solomon, and she, she will um, basically aspire with a tech paper. She will just suck the drop out of the, of the electrodes and I will pipette a high concentrated uh, nitrate solution onto the electrodes. And by doing that, you see there's a jump, so there's a change in the potential, which basically is a low high, just to show the principle. Uh, so this is, again, this is the raw signal. And uh, so the current, uh, the potential, sorry, that you are measuring is correspond, corresponds to 
the, um, the actual different concentrations of nitrate. So uh, thank you very much for watching. Uh, I'll give it back to you, Martin. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, I'm always really impressed with what a professional job you know you guys do. I mean, you know, I, I think it, it says a lot about. So if you stop sharing the video, that'd be great. But it says a lot about the, the science, and it says a lot about you, the talent that you guys have. So it's very nice to see the change in the voltage when you added when you changed the nitrate um, concentration. So if Georgie stops sharing the video, that'd be great, and I will stop sharing my actual camera but we'll carry on i'm going to go a little bit faster now because i realize um, i appreciate um you know essentially and there's been over 100 people in a continuous manner on this so i appreciate that and i realize we need to let some of you go and go to lectures or go back to work so we're going to um speak a little bit faster let's say all right so we've done a potentiometric demonstration now we're going to talk about amperometry so i know it's, there's don't forget this this video will be on youtube afterwards you can rewind it because it's in voltammetry, we were changing the voltage and measuring the current. In amperometry, we just hold the voltage where it is. So it's much simpler in some ways. So, for example, with many um, enzyme based assays, when I say enzyme based assays, I mean ones that use oxidase, so glucose oxidase, lactate oxidase, um, lots, of the, um, uh, lots of the oxidases, we often use 650 millivolts. Um, for example, we just leave it constant as a function of time. Um, depending on the solution, you've seen the guys today do a lot of drop testing. Um, when you're doing drop testing onto an electrode, you can have sometimes a signal that um, changes as a function of time. And this is just, this is normal. This is due to the depletion of material near the electrode. They call it a Cottrell response. But it just kind of says that um, you're depleting material, the material is not diffusing in fast enough to replenish it, and it's diffusion limited. If you saw the raw signal from many commercial glucose sensors, where you test a drop of blood, they would actually have this kind of um, transient where the signal changes a function of time, and they often integrate underneath this um, curve at around five seconds to give you the, um, the glucose concentration, because the current is proportional to the concentration, but it's changing as a function of um, the square root of time, and it's due to um, diffusion. So we have current, um, and it changes with, as I say, a function of time, but the signal is proportional to concentration. I want to just, we're going to, we are going to do a glucose demonstration, but I, I had a question the other day um, about generation one and generation two glucose sensors. So the first thing to say is a lot of what we do at Zimmer Peacock, we do it on something called the hypervalue um, electrodes. You heard guys mention that today. And um, we take an electrode. Um, we might fight, if we're going to make a glucose sensor, we might functionalize it with a mediator. When we do that, that's a generation two sensor. We might put the enzymes onto it. So for example, glucose oxidase would make it a glucose sensor. Lactate oxidase would make it a lactate sensor. And we might put the barrier layer onto it. I'll tell you the role of the barrier layer now. So with enzyme sense sensors, sometimes the enzymes don't have enough activity to be um, linear in the clinical range that you want. So you put a barrier layer down there just to keep some of the glucose off the enzyme. So we, we actually repel it um, a little bit. But the enzymes, that, sorry, the, the glucose that does get through undergoes a enzymatic reaction where glucose um, with glucose oxidase um, in the um, produces la um, glucolactone. And this only happens in the presence of oxygen. So we get hydrogen peroxide. So when you're making a glucose sensor, at least a generation two glucose sensor, you might have a barrier layer, an enzyme layer, and a mediator. Um, and you know the heart of it is this reaction where glucose reacts with glucose oxidase in the presence of hydrogen peroxide. And we form a product called hydrogen peroxide. Now, um, hydrogen peroxide um, in a generation two sensor can react with a mediator. So essentially the mediator takes the electrons from hydrogen peroxide, recycles it back to oxygen, and then it's the mediator that then reacts or acts at the electrode surface to give us electrons. So the definition of, of a generation two glucose sensor is a you know, an enzyme glucose sensing system with a mediator in presence. And the benefit of the 
PTHR is we can use voltages that are less than 650 millivolts. The first generation of glucose sensors was very similar, um, but you didn't, and I'll just, you didn't have a mediator. So in fact, you were just detecting the hydrogen peroxide directly. And these are called generation one um, glucose sensors. And it's probably just as a side of note, I think the first glucose sensor was built in approximately 1957 or maybe 1958 by a guy called Leyland Clark. So, you know, this goes back, uh, let's say, a long way. Um, but a generation one glucose sensor, you direct, you detect, for example, hydroperoxide directly, and in a generation two, you use a mediator. At Zimmer Pigot, we use both, and it really, whether we use one or the other, depends on the the cost, uh, what the what the application requires, and the accuracy that the uh, application requires. So now we're going to go to a demonstration. I realize it's one minute past eight, so I'm just going to say to the Norwegian team, over to you guys. But don't feel like you have to spend a lot of time on this, guys. No problem, Martin. So here we are. So uh, once again, we are going to demonstrate the um, uh, chrono amperometry uh, technique. In this case, we are going to demonstrate on our glucose sensors. This is a ZP glucose sensor. It's an enzyme-based um, sensor. This is uh, basically how it looks. Again, it, it, the formulation uh, goes on the working electrode in order to, to make actually the ceramic uh, substrate into a sensor. And what I will do is, again, we will use the Enerpot, which is connected to a normal SPE uh, screen printed electrode connector. So this is a commercial one. It's connected via, via cable to the Enerpot. And what we are going to do is we will, instead of inserting the sensor here, we'll actually insert it here onto this SPE connector. And we will run uh, a big, basically a beaker test. The, the objective of running a beaker test is by uh, using constant stirring, what we'll do is we will be supplying, we'll be constantly supplying um, uh, glucose to the electrode. Uh, so not depleting the electrode of glucose and therefore having a drop in signal. So um, the important thing is just to immerse the, the electrodes, the working electrodes. One has to be careful in order not to uh, wet the SP connector and therefore shorting those connectors, those uh, those uh, contact points. And again, with the help of the PES Trace software, uh, what we have here is just basically a chronoamperometry technique. We are again connected to the Enerpod. Uh, we choose a current range. So in this in this instance, between 100 nanoamps and 10 microamps should do the job. We are, this is again, like Martin has specified before, we are applying a potential to it, a 650 millivolt potential. This is because this is the oxidation peak. If you will do a CV scan, you will notice that this is the oxidation peak of glucose. And again, this is just the scan, the, the, the sample, uh, the sampling rate. And here, the, the time we run the experiment. So I will start running it so that you can see that how it looks a typical. Um, this is a typical uh, amperometric curve. Uh, so you have two effects here on this curve. One is basically the double layer capacitance effect, so rearrangement of the ions on those uh, between the metal and the, 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 the liquid interface. And the other one is the bulk diffusion, so the diffusion of ions inside those solutions. And so we're just going to wait uh, a little bit here, not as much as we would hope for. So we're just trying to stabilize to get a good baseline. And after that, what I will do is I will titrate into the solution that's constantly being stirred. This is just a PBS solution, a phosphate buffer solution. And I'm going to add now from a stock solution of one molar glucose in PBS, I will pipette approximately uh, 50 uh, microliters into, into, um, into 10 milliliters of buffer solution. And with that, I should have approximately five uh, millimolar step um, increase in glucose. So, uh, so uh, now I will add. And as you can see, once I added, 
you see a jump in the current uh, that is due to the oxidation of more glucose, more glucose that was added to the solution. And this is the corresponding to a typical uh, five uh, millimolar uh, um, jump in concentration, in glucose concentration. And again, so the, the amount of current that uh, one observes is proportional to the concentration of glucose in that solution. The reason why it's saying so stable there at the top is basically because we are under steering conditions. So uh, again, thank you for watching and I'll give it back to you, Mark. Yeah, so thank you very much, um, Norway. I appreciate it. Um, now I'm actually gonna cut out a, a whole section now on EIS. If it's interesting to people, we can do at another time a webinar on EIS, and that's electrochemical impedance spectroscopy. The only reason I'm cutting it out is I appreciate it's six minutes past um, the hour, for at least in Europe it is. Um, and, you know, so I'm actually just going to go on to the last section. We won't do EIS today, and we'll be um, very quick. Um, so I just want to give you some practical, you know, sort of hints and tips about electrochemistry. You know, when you're when you're setting up these electrochemical cells, um, the potential stats often have three cables. They're color coded reference working counter. Um, we also have the same color coding um, technique as well. So, if you have any, if you look at a potential stat, you just see cables. Just know that the blue is for reference, the red is for working, the black is for counter. We follow the same convention. I also just want to make a comment that a lot of um, university experiments are done on glassy carbon electrodes. Um, it's probably worth talking to people like Technando because, in fact, we're able to get glassy carbon type data on these screen printed electrodes. Where I know that the peak separation, you know, is meant to be for a one electron transfer of about 59 millivolts. We get 75, but I think for teaching and for actually doing research, these are um, pretty good. And so I think screen printed electrodes and it also this the signal for fairy ferrous cyanide is proportional to the scan, uh, um, the square root of scan rate. Um, also, be careful when you're using sometimes screen printed electrodes. If you have these sharp peaks in there, it's often because you've contaminated the working electrode with, for example, silver ink. So that's just a heads up. We see that quite a lot. If you're using gold electrodes, even if they're screen printed electrodes, give them a little wash with something like 10 millimolar um, hydrochloric acid because they're often gold tarnishes very quickly. So you do need to um, um, give them a little clean and then you'll get some nicer cyclovoltametry. So that's just a little tip. Um, if you get very distorted data, it's because you probably have a high resistance and your connector might be bad or your cable might be bad. So if you don't get beautiful cyclovoltametry, sometimes it's because you have a high resistance. If you have poor connection, you can get a lot of electrical noise. Um, in the signal, so it is important to have good, let's say, connection. Um, and again, if you get poor looking data, it's often the connectors that's actually the problem. So I went very quickly just at the end there, and I did cut out a whole piece on EIS, but I just want to sort of summarize and say, today you saw cyclovoltametry, we did the, um, the chili demonstration, you saw potentiometry, we did the nitrate demonstration, and most importantly, let's say the biggest biosensor in the world, you saw a nice demonstration from the team on glucose sensing um, and I did skip the EIS because of the, the time. I do want to say a, a very special thanks to um, our host today um, and I'm happy to turn over to our host and I'm happy to turn over to also questions and answers. So uh, I will stop sharing um, my well my screen for a bit and I want to say theory, thank you very much um, for allowing us to um, speak today. And I'll also say, if you've got any questions, put them in the live chat, and I will um, take a look at, at that as well. So that's the um, uh, presentation. Um, but um, thank you very much. And I'll stop sharing. Thank you, uh, Dr. Martin. It was a wonderful session. And uh, there were a few questions in the chat box. Uh, uh, I may uh, ask you a few questions from that. Uh, one of the questions was like, what is the role of chili pot buffer in the measurement? And uh, uh, But I, I guess you have already answered that like uh, in the uh, lecture. But then like, did you see the study of effect of interfering analytes present in the sample in the capsule in 
detection? That was the question asked by a uh, attendee. Yeah. So the, the good, the, the good. So the, 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 there, there are uh, interferences, and um, because we're doing voltammetry, we try to spot those interferences and we try to subtract them from the signal. Now, what we did do is we, you know, we, we validated the technology by actually running the same sample on an HPLC and on our chili sensor. So there are there are interferences, and we have to try and spot them. The nice thing about chili products is the chili is intrinsically really quite high concentration so in the like in the real world sometimes you know it's a chili sauce it's meant to be full of chili and therefore it's often the dominant like molecule in that sample so that does um, hide interferences we also have validated using HPLC um, and then maybe you know when, when I was talking about um, you know let's say competition the competition is people's t tongues, which are really inaccurate, or the HPLC, which we validated against, and the chili is actually intrinsically high. The reason I can't say, you know, we, the, you know you're a scientist, so if somebody decides to put in, let's say, paracetamol, acetaminophen, all sorts of strange chemicals, these are also electrochemically active, so I can see a problem there, but um, most of the time, not all of the time, we, 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 you know, it's been okay. Um, but we do look for those interferences and we do try to subtract them from the signal. It's a tough all question, right. but I appreciate it. Okay. Uh, like, uh, uh, there's another question, like, uh, however, I think uh, you have addressed this also. What type of enzyme is used uh, It is uh, uh, to sense capsaicin? So with the capsaicin, we actually have a... Um, a I use the word mediator um, during my glucose talk. So yes. we actually have a catalytic surface. So we're not using, we're using a non-enzymatic system, but we have a cat, we do have a, you know, and it's a proprietary system, but we do have a catalytic surface for detecting the capsaicin. So we're not using an enzyme, we're using a catalytic surface. So it's a modified carbon catalytic surface. All right. Uh, there was uh, one more question. A few questions were answered by Aftab already, uh, but then there is one more question. Uh, which ink material is used for fabricating this nitrate de detector, ISC electrode? The material uh, which uh, they have used for the nitrate. Yeah, so, so, the, so the, 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 the base material, you know, we've used one of our hypervalue carbon electrodes. So the ink is essentially a carbon ink. But then we have used again. It's you know this is the problem with with, with sorry with industry like us that again it's there's a proprietary source on there to make it specific to nitrate. So that that is. But I would encourage anyone who's trying to make it an iron selective electrode. You know carbon is is a good material to use as the base material. But then you have to invent the piece on top to actually doing the sensing itself. All right. Uh, thank you, Dr. Martin. Uh, and I have a personal, uh, I mean, I have a question. Like, uh, sure. uh, uh, we uh, work on electrochemistry and uh, we have been doing a lot of uh, trials on uh, uh, identifying uh, uh, materials which can sense ions or uh, other material. So, uh, do you have any specific optimizing technique like to improve the material? Um. God, that's a tough question. Yeah. I, 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 yeah. I think, I think, yeah, I, I, I think, um, not so much technique, but we, you know, like you. In fact, yeah, I mean, what one thing that we are getting quite interested in these days, and we we should have done it earlier, is actually design of experiment. So we didn't, we okay. didn't use to, so we didn't used to do so much design of experiment, but these days we will. Do some screening experiments, you know, to sort of, you know, fundamentally what do we think the answer is, and then we will actually to optimize it. We'll, you know, we'll, you know, you know, we will then say a high level, a low level, and a medium level on the on the parameter that we think is important, and on a few of the parameters. So the answer is, we, you know, it, I know it's very well. It's it's done a lot in in you know, many people. We obviously did not invent design yes. of experiment, but actually. I, I would suggest design of experiment is actually we're finding that quite valuable. So screening experiments in the traditional lab way, you know, changing one thing at a time, and then when you think you've got the formula fairly robust, then go to design of experiment and test out you test it out that way. 
that. Thank you, Dr. Martin. Like, because we would like to hear it from the industrial point of view, because uh, as uh, at academics, we work a lot on that, and we feel it difficult to uh, uh, reach the accuracy of uh, what uh, you guys are reaching. So that's why I've just asked about this question. Thank you, Dr. Martin. Thank you for your well, I, uh, I, lecture. I appreciate, I appreciate the questions. Um, yeah. I personally... Thank you for uh, accepting the invitation, uh, you know, uh, just without any hesitation. And uh, it was really a wonderful uh, experience for us because uh, uh, we, we could see a lot of uh, hands on or a lot of uh, demonstrations also. Thank you so much for your uh, uh, time and uh, concern. Well, thank you very much. Um, yeah. So I will say goodbye. We'll end the, um, the demo. I know there's a few questions um, in the chat. So if there's questions in the chat that are not answered, it might be worth reaching out to Technando and we maybe will send a form out to try and collect some of the questions and we'll, we'll answer them in future webinars. So thank you very much for your time today. Yep. Um, Dr. Saria, thank you very much to Technando and have a good day. Thank you. Thank you.